How you doing, ladies and gentlemen? I'm Pop Links, and I'm back with another book review. Do, 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 do. That's like my theme song. I like have to do that every time I start. Today's book review is Plants of the Gods. And this book is, I would say, in the herbalism, anthropology section. Section? Maybe ethnobotany, mycology, and ethnography. It basically goes through all the plants in the world that were used from ancient indigenous cultures, pre-illiterate people, not primitive. That's a that's a, um, a shady nomenclature that was attributed to people who didn't speak quote unquote English in the time of, you know, colonialism. And that nomenclature still sticks around today when people talk about tribes of people who still live in the jungle, et cetera. Nomadic pastoralists, they get associated with the word primitive when in fact, a lot of technologies they were using, you know, natural technology, nature, and some facets were more advanced than the techniques we use today. So I just want to shed a little bit of light on the things that they were doing. And no further ado, we can dive right in. One of my favorite sections immediately is I'm going to go to the Buiti tribe in Gabon. They use a plant called Iboga, Iboga tabernithia. If that's hard to follow, I will leave, you know, caption, classifications, pictures of these particular plants and whatnot. So with Iboga, they found out without getting too technical that Iboga itself has anti-addictive properties, which I should have had this highlighted and stickered or whatever, but I'll find it. It has anti-addictive properties, meaning that if you are kicking an addiction from alcohol, amphetamines, uh, anxiolytics, any type of withdrawal that you go through from separating yourself from these addictive compounds negates the entire withdrawal phase. So if you're trying to kick an addiction, we know from clinical research studies and from, you know, experience from dealing with people in that space, that that's one of the hardest things to do. And if you can totally bypass that whole withdrawal phase and immediately start uh, integration of what you experience and go through treatment, the psychotherapist or integration specialist, then you can make some real promising work happen really fast. And I think that's just one of the amazing benefits of these plants that people like to ignore due to scientific nomenclatures that like to say that they pinpointed medicine and that they figured out what a panacea is in the realm of pharmacology. And that's just not the case when we actually have plants that are still around to this day and that have been used far longer than some of these pharmaceutical compounds that people ingest every day for diseases that could possibly be alleviated or decimated with plants. Um, well, back to this, I happened to find it in the first flip. And this is what I was talking about right here, Ebola. So they were showing a little bit of it. Addiction therapy with Ibogaine. And the Buiti tribe in Gabon uses this to communicate with the dead. Now this is their ancestral lineage, their, their religion, you could say that. I hate to use that word because I feel like that has a lot of negative stigma attached to it. But nonetheless, their religion and what they do to communicate with the dead. Now, mind you, their culture and their ide ideas or ideology, I should say, um, predate colonialism. So any aspect of attaching it to millenarianism or using the perspective lens of millenarianism, which is anything based in Roman Catholicism. So if you're going through the perspective or lens of Roman Catholicism, then this might sound a little fishy to you, but just hang in there because this information is really handy. So what they, you with the plant, they have a ceremony and then the people in the tribe, the shaman, goes into a trance. And one thing about Iboga is everyone says that I've never took an Iboga, but from all the clinical research that I've read and all the reports that I've read from people who took it is that there's a high probability that you communicate with a dead ancestor. Um, is this a hallucination? That's nor here nor there. 
we could we could talk about skeptical con concepts of reality and say, well, is this, is this reality we're experiencing a simulation, and is this real? That gets on the that gets onto philosophy, and we're not trying to go there today. But what I'm trying to say is, they use this plants to communicate with the dead. They have entire tribes of it that predate Roman Catholicism and the perspective lens of millenarianism. That's what we have to keep in context here: is that a lot of us come from a society that the values of another system was already instilled in us. So our perspective lens is slightly biased when it comes to understanding indigenous cultures through the lens of millenarianism. But if we could just shed the skin of ignorance just for a second and look through the lens of somebody else's culture, then you can get an immense understanding of what these plants have the capacity to do. Um, what else? It basically goes through every plant that was used in almost every tribe from around the world. And it goes, it breaks down every section of the world. It goes to North America, Asia, Africa, South America. I, I'm very, I don't think it really touches anything on Antarctica or anything like that because it's just too cold for anything to grow there. Um, and... Uh, yeah, this is a phenomenal book. Anybody interested in ethnobotany and the origins of religion and the iconography attached to it, the synesthesia, the switching of sensations, um, the hypnagogia you get, the, the fact that we have symbols in all of our religions. We have symbols, as a matter of fact, all across the world, from crosses to swastikas to uh, swirling circles to you name it any type of icon that you can think of or symbol are seen in these particular trances. And the crazy thing is, is that we have historical, historical data that proves that people 70,000, 80,000, 100,000 years ago were in caves taking these ancient visionary plants and seeing the same symbols in their visions that we were using, or should I say that we are using today. I, feel, I think that's profound because how could you have a plant that you can take that induces visions of symbols that we use today, like the addition sign, stuff like that. It's, it's, how would that be in there? Like, what does that have to do with the human experience? And what does that mean? I don't know. Just here to speculate and explain to you why this book is one of my favorite books. <laughs> what else? Um, I don't know. It's just... If you're just really interested in nature and how some of the myths became myths, like Santa Claus, Santa Claus was associated with Soma. Soma was around roughly four or 5,000 years ago. Um, the Siberian shamanism, that's why we have a Christmas tree because the Amanita muscaria mushroom has a mycorrhi mycorrhizal relationship with a Douglas fir tree, if I'm not mistaken. I get Douglas fir evergreen. Sorry if I got the wrong conifer mixed up. But um, yeah, so, so that's why they say that presents are under the tree because the mushrooms have a mycorrhizal relationship with that particular type of tree. So they grow at the base of that tree, the roots or under the tree where it would normally be the presence. Um, and what mycorrhizal means is that the, the, my, the mycelium and the roots of the tree make an integrated connection together and create a nutrient-based system where they share nutrients and information with not only the tree and the fungus, but the surrounding environment to see what it needs to survive. Basically, it just, it's, a, it's a reciprocated relationship. Um, so we also got stockings that you hang by the fireplace. That's what, that's what they would use to dry the Amanita muscaria mushroom. Um, you got the reindeer. The reindeer like to eat the Amanita muscaria mushroom and it was a natural intoxicant for them and they just like to run and jump around and enjoy themselves. You get the flying reindeer. Uh, the color Santa Claus is red and white. It's the same color as the Amanita muscaria mushroom. Um, what else? What other specification? Oh, elves. Elves, quote unquote, I know the word demon has a negative stigma attached to it, but you got to take it out of the millenary and Christian context to understand what the demon is. And I don't really want to get into that, but that's another history lesson. But the demon artificer is the elf. Elves, you feel me? They make toys for children. 
And where is Santa Claus located? At the North Pole, the Axis Mundi, Idrisil, the World Ash, the, the Tree of Life. You know what I mean? So if you break down most of these religions and you break down the symbology behind it and you trace back through history, preferably pre-illiterate history before, you know, they went around the world and solipsized everybody through imperialism. But anyway, if you trace the roots to all these stories, you can basically find the origins of a lot of a lot of these stories, if not all of them, are based on ancient people using ancient visionary plants, having visions, and then coming back to the tribe and communicating what they saw. Prime example was Moses. There's a actual there's actually a group of Jerusalem scholars that said the burning bush that Moses was next to was Acacia Nalatica. Now Acacia Nalatica has high amounts of DMT. Here's another uh organic chemistry. DMT is a natural neurotransmitter endogenously produced in the human brain. It's responsible for making you dream, essentially. Um, it's produced in mass amounts when you're first born and when you pass away. And at the highest concentration of DMT is in the brain at 3 a.m. So if anyone has any clinical research or has done any research on DMT or have any read any books on DMT, we know that DMT has a high, high percentage of catapulting people's consciousness into an alternate dimension, alternate space, you name it. Is it true or not? We can get into the clinical research and that'd be a whole different discussion with the book, DMT, The Spirit Molecule. Professor, sorry, Dr. Rick Strassman actually did uh, an extensive clinical trial on DMT because he was looking for a more effective way to suppress the bleeding for women on their menstrual cycles and while they give birth, but come to find out DMT was out of this world. <laughs> you know, you know, that, in layman's terms, it was out of this world. So he had to wrap his head around how could this naturally endogenous molecule do this to the human brain when it's naturally produced in the human brain. It was, it was profound. So um, they basically just shed light on knowledge that might be lost to everyone due to, you know, the way the world operates and the particular cereal grains we only use today. We deviated from millions of plants, millions of plants we use, if not thousands, you know, just stay modest for different things. We, we use them for successful copulation. We use them for sustenance. We use them for enjoying ourselves, mystical experiences. We use them for pretty much everything. And then, like I mentioned before, we left all those plants behind, maybe because we moved to a more sedentary lifestyle. We invented agriculture. We didn't really need all those plants. I wouldn't say we didn't need them, but we chose to abandon them. And then we took up the cereal grains and we ran with them. And those are only the plants we use today. And I believe 70 to 80% of all medicine used today come from, from, from plants. All pharmaceuticals are basically made from plants. So that's very, something very peculiar right there is that the medicine that we use today are plant-based. The ones that work the best, but hey, I, I can't say that for 100%. That's just my opinion. <laughs> I can't say that. It's truth. But I um, just want to show you guys some, some other artwork here. They explain what goes on inside the brain. Um, what you're seeing, the different tribes and what they use, how long they've been using it, the historical lineage, the, the paintings from all around the world. It, this is really an amazing book because you really have no idea how many plants were used and for how long, thousands of thousands of years. So if you're interested in expanding your knowledge in herbalism and anthropology, and learning the, the, the roots of religion and the transformative properties of plants, that this is your book. Look no further. Plants of the Gods, literally, I believe, truthfully, is the root of all religion. There's no religion without plants and fungus. All right, keep that in mind. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Thank you for your views and spending time here because you could have been anywhere in the world but you were here with me watching my plants of the gods book review and yeah hope you have a good day peace